Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to the Spectral Geometry in the Cloud. So today we have Antoine Metra, uh, who will talk about Dirac eigenvalue optimization on surfaces. Antoine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Asma, for the introduction. And thank you for all the organizers for keeping this seminar running all this time. It's a really nice uh, Zoom seminar. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Dirac eigenvalue optimization on spaces. And this is part of a joint work with uh, Mikhail Karpukin and Josip Polterovich. Okay, so the main idea when thinking about those kind of eigenvalue optimization problem on uh, manifolds, when the, basically we vary the metric, we look at the eigenvalue and how they vary, and we try to find maximum, minimum of the eigenvalue, and how the critical metric achieving those minimum or maximum have special properties. So in some way, the goal of the talk is pretty much looking at this relationship between again value optimization problem and some geometric object. So basically the geometric object that we will get will come from the criticality condition we get on the metrics we have. So in this talk in particular, we'll mainly, mainly focus on harmonic maps. Okay. So why is it interesting? Well, there's two sides to this uh, relationship. There's the spectral side where this kind of relationship allows us to find some minimum or maximal metric for different eigenvalues on different, let's say, surfaces, and also allows us to obtain sharp uh, bounds for eigenvalues. For example, uh, the the first uh, reason this uh, relationship between eigenvalue optimization problem and harmonic maps and minimal surfaces was developed was, for example, Nadir Shuli in the 90s, where I used that to obtain, uh, to find the maximal uh, metric on the torus, for example and show that the maximum metric on the torus correspond to the flat metric on the equality on torus. So this is nice. You can get really sharp bounds on eigenvalues if you're able to actually find maximal or minimal metrics. The other side of the equation is the geometric side. It turns out that through this relationship, we get new ways to construct uh, minimal surfaces or uh, free boundary minimal surfaces, if you look at the set of problem, or even uh, CMC surfaces. So CMC surfaces are constant mean character surfaces. They will appear a little bit in this talk, basically. When you look at the, the um, uh, Dirac problem and try to optimize second value, sometimes you can rewrite the, the minimality condition in terms of CMC surfaces. So that's also interesting if you're more interested in the analytical uh, geometric side then maybe that's why you will be interested in this uh, kind of problem. Okay. So first I'll set up the what I'm going to talk about, like the problem itself. We have M, some orientable compact connected surfaces. The orientability is not necessary in some cases. It, it is necessary when you look at the Dirac operator, but this just to be able to define things nicely. Uh, so just to be sure, I put it there, orientable, but maybe we can remove it depending on which problem you're looking at. Okay. Usually I'll use G to denote a smooth metric on your on the surface. And I'll use a square bracket G to denote the conformal class of metrics, which are conformally equivalent to G. So basically uh, any metric you can obtain by multiplying G by some positive function. Okay. And finally, I want to start the talk by looking at the criticality, con criticality condition for the um, metrics in some kind of generality. So not focus on one problem right now, but more in, in a general way. So I will denote by T of G, some differential operator, which depend on the metric G. And I'll just ask that it is self-adjoint because that will make the eigenvalue um, real and make also my calculation easier and satisfy nice enough properties so that you can actually study the eigenvalue problem on your surface with this uh, operator, okay? And I'll require another con condition is that some kind of conformal uh, covariance of the operator. So basically, if you multiply the metric by some conformal uh, factor e to the two omega, then the e to the two omega can pop out of the operator uh, to a power alpha, so power alpha, and then you recover the original operator. Okay. This is not uh, essential. You can consider other problem where you don't have this kind of uh, conformal covariance. But for the kind of generality I want to show in the first part of the talk, uh, I require it because it makes the calculation much easier. And 
the, the two operators I want to discuss in this talk, which is the Laplacian on surfaces and the Dirac operator on surfaces, both satisfy this kind of conformal uh, relationship. So for those two that you can have in mind, if you think about this, this is exactly what we have. But this operator T could be something else if you, if you want. Okay. And finally, the eigenvalue of the operator, I'll usually denote then lambda, well, some other letter. And the bar over the, the letter uh, is there to denote that we normalize it by some power of the area so that the eigenvalue is invariant under homotopy of the metric. So if you rescale your metric, the eigenvalue stays the same. Yeah. This is just so that we actually have a nice problem when we're trying to optimize and we can just have like trivial like non-existence of minimizer or maximizer just by rescaling the metric in, in, in some way. So this way we remove all the rescaling. Okay. So what I want to derive in the first part of the talk is this criticality condition that says that if you have a conformally critical metric G for some normalized eigenvalue, then there exists um, a family of lambda eigenfunctions F1 to Fm such that the sum of norm squared is equal to one on the manifold. Okay. And we can go the other way around. So if you have this type of family of eigenfunction, that means that the, the metric is critical for some lambda j. Uh, I'll only show in one direction because that's the easy direction. You can kind of guess how to go the other direction. Yeah. But first, I need to explain what do we mean by g critical for uh, lambda bar. Uh, okay. So first, uh, I'll also note that sometimes I'll drop the conformity critical because we're always, I'm only focusing on criticality in one conform, on conform class in this talk. So it's a bit of a mouthful to always say conformally critical metrics. So sometimes I'll just say critical metrics. So remember, I'm not looking at criticality in like the class of all the, all metrics just uh, in one conform class, okay? So what do we mean by G critical for Lambda? Uh, usually when, when we mean that something is critical is like we look at the derivative of the, the something and look at where, when is it that the derivative is zero and that's the critical points. The problem is that lambda is not uh, at their, their differentiable function of the metric. It's at most Lipschitz. And this is because you can have intersection of multiple branches of eigenvalues. So for example, in this drawing, you have lambda k and lambda k goes up, 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 up until it intersect the branch going down. And then you have a a point where you don't have differentiability and you go down again. Okay, outside of those points where you have branch points, uh, everything's nice and you can actually take the derivative, but at those points, you can't take the derivatives. Now, the problem is that those points are actually the ones that are interesting for us most of the time. Because, well, automatically when you have two branches that uh, crosses, those correspond to uh, local minimum and local maximum. For example, in this drawing, this point is, uh, well, could be, um, it's not always, but could be a local minimum for the for this, uh, for lambda k and a local, no, local minimum for lambda k plus one, a local maximum for lambda k, okay? So the definition of criticality I'll use is that we ask that for all family, um, one parameter smooth family of metric g of t, with g of zero is equal to g zero, g zero will be the critical point. And we normalize the, the area of the metric to be equal to one for the, the all the metric in the family, we ask that the left uh, left derivative of the eigenvalue and the right derivative of the eigenvalue, when you multiply together, you have something that's non-positive. So basically, it means that either when you're going to the, the point where you cannot take the derivative, but you can always take either the left or the right derivative, this you can always do, either you're going up and then down, or you're going down and then up. Right, so that's the why we ask that the product of them is non-negative, okay? And we ask this to be true for any family, uh, let's say smooth or I mean, and let's say analytic family of uh, metric it will make things easier. So this is what we mean by critical metric for eigenvalues. That we have one direction goes up and one direction goes down, all the inverse. So how do we derive this type of criticality condition? Okay, and it's actually quite easy. Okay. Simply because I, I set up the problem nicely in that I ask for this type of conformally, uh, conformity property of the operator, so that if you multiply your metric by some conformal factor, you can pop it out in front of the operator. So it makes it easier to actually do the computation without knowing what t of g is in any way. 
So you start from the eigenvalue equation. So lambda of g of t, here f of t denotes um, the eigenvalue, the eigenfunction corresponding to lambda, the lambda g of t. And I'll uh, assume that in the case where uh, things are differentiable and we don't have multiplicity, basically. So you, you restrict yourself to only one branch. You don't go to a intersection point, <clears throat> okay? So f of t, you don't have any choice in this. It's like clearly, de clearly defined. Okay, so you have this on the left side and it's equal to t of g of t of f of t. And this, thanks to the conformal, um, conformal property of your operator, you can just pop out the, the conformal factor in front where omega of t correspond to like the family g of t of the metric in the conformal class. Okay. So this is the eigenvalue equation. You take the t derivative of the equation. Okay. So you get lambda dot f plus lambda f dot, and same thing on the other side, where you have a derivative that comes from taking the derivative of the conformal factor, and <clears throat> a derivative coming from taking the derivative of the eigen uh, function. Okay. Now we have a little problem with this equation is that we know nothing about f dot. We don't know how it behaves or what, what it looks like. So we can't really use it as it is, especially when you need to take the operator of f dot, it's really not clear what you get. So what we do is we take the product with f and we integrate. So the first term will give you a norm of f squared. The second term will give you the, the product f and f dot and same thing on the other side. <clears throat> Okay, and now oh, there's a typo here. There's a t that's too too many. There's no t here. Um, so if you don't have this t here, you look at this product and you uh, you use that t is self-adjoint to move it to the other side in front of the f, and then this term, the the last integral and this integral, will cancel out because f being a solution. Uh, uh, eigenfunction being a solution of the eigenvalue equation is also a weak solution. So when you look at the, the, the weak formulation of the equation, it, this is exactly the weak formulation of the equation and you can cancel out this term with this term. And what remains is that you can write down that lambda dot is equal to this uh, thing, okay? So we have the first step in finding critical points. We have the derivative of uh, the eigenvalue. And now we just need to use this derivative of eigenvalue to try to find critical points. Well, to try to find critical condition for the metric. Okay. So how do we do that? So remember, we normalize the area to be always equal to one. So that means that when you look at the integral of the conformal factor, well, the derivative of the conformal factor, this will be zero. Okay. So, okay. We have the, the volume of the derivative of lambda which is given by that. And finally, well, what can we say? If we have no multiplicity, so if we have a true critical point, so a point where <clears throat> the derivative of lambda is zero for any variation of the metric, so for any omega dot, which is orthogonal to the constant, you have that lambda dot is equal to zero, but lambda dot is just the integral of uh, f squared times omega dot. So that means that f squared must be a constant. So this is the easy case when you don't have multiplicity and you have a critical point without multiplicity, then you must have that we have a again function, which is constant of constant norm, norm on the uh, manifold. Okay. The difficult case is when you actually have multiplicity, because as you remember, when you have multiplicity, it's actually not uh, differentiable at this point. So you can't just look at, okay, this is equal to zero. You need to argue a little bit. And for this case, I'll do it in an unwavy way. I'll give the intuition, doing it properly actually is uh, tricky. And uh, I think the first one to actually do it uh, nicely was uh, I think actually in the 90s, stuff like that. It's a bit more tricky. You need to use Anbanak to make it work and everything. But the intuition is quite easy. If you have a critical point and you have multiplicity, that means that in one direction, you go up. In another direction, for example, let's say it's a local uh, maximum. In one direction, you go up. In another direction, you go down. Okay, so that means that in the eigenspace of your uh, in the eigenspace, you can find one eigenvalue eigenfunction so that the derivative is positive, and you can find another uh, eigenfunction such, such that the derivative is negative, and then looking at uh, looking at the the, the 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 what it means for uh, lambda dot, 
well, if lambda dots is the, the negative, that means that you can find an eigenfunction such that the integral of f squared f one squared omega dot is negative, and same thing for the positive case. And taking a linear combination of those two, you get something that can be constant. Well, that can uh, integrate to zero, so that means it must be a, a constant. Okay. To make this rigorous, because in this case we're only looking at one, let's say, variation. To make this rigorous is a bit more uh, difficult. But this is intu the intuition: is that if you have multiplicity, you need to take linear combination over the eigenspace of the different uh, eigenfunction to try to find something that's constant, because it needs to be orthogonal to the variation space, and the variation space is orthogonal to constants. Okay. So this is how you can uh, find easily. Uh, critical condition, and I encourage you to try applying this type of reasoning to whatever operator you have in mind and whatever again, eigenvalue problem you can have in mind can be interesting. Okay, so we have this critical condition. Now, uh, this is not the last step in the talk because I still have quite a lot of time. And the more important part is that the right hand side is quite useless as it is written right now because that's quite nice, but you don't know the eigenfunction usually. When you're looking at a problem, you don't know explicitly the eigenfunction. So actually having a criticality condition that depends on the eigenfunction is kind of uh, wonky. And it's even worse when, if you try to find critical metrics, to find the eigenfunction, to be able to, to go the other side. So starting from eigenfunction, find the critical metrics. To, to go this side, well, you need to know the metric to find the eigenfunction, but you're trying to find the metrics. So it's not really usable, okay? And this is the difficult part, is actually taking, uh, giving a sense to the right-hand side of this correspondence, okay? And this is where each problem will be different and uh, have a different interpretation. So in this talk, I'll focus on, well, I'll give as an example the Laplace uh, eigenvalue problem because it's a little bit more known, and then I'll focus on the Dirac uh, eigenvalue problem. So as an example, we can look at the Laplacian on surfaces. On surfaces, well, I pick my example carefully so it works, you can just, uh, when you um, multiply by some conform factor your metric, it pops out in front of the Laplacian and you can do apply the, the result I just showed. Yeah. And then you need to, so starting from a conform metric, critical metric, uh, you get a family of eigenfunction which sums to one. What do you do with those eigenfunction? Well, the, the, the bright idea uh, that people add is that you can use those eigenfunctions as uh, coordinates for a map that will go from your surface to Euclidean space, m-dimensional Euclidean space. And noticing by the that by the uh, critical condition that they must sum that, that their sum squared is equal to one on every point of the, the surface, that means that your map is not really to Euclidean uh, M space. It's actually to the M minus one dimensional sphere living in this, this space. So you get a map from your surface to the sphere. To something. So you don't know the dimension of the, the sphere. I'm sure it depends on the, the dimension of the again space and other things, but you get a map to, to a sphere. Okay. And then you look at the eigenvalue equation because the map is given coordinate wise by your eigenfunction. You can just apply uh, the Laplacian to your map coordinate wise, and you get that uh, delta f is equal to lambda f. But this equation for a map from some sphere face to a sphere is exactly the harmonicity uh, equation for the map. So that means that f is a, is a harmonic map. Okay. Uh, in this case, harmonic map are critical point of the energy functional. So the energy functional is you integrate the energy density, which is the f squared, well, the norm of the f squared, um, over the manifold. And you look at critical points. So under variation of the map, the, the metric is fixed. This um, formulation is much nicer than the formulation in terms of eigenfunctions, because suddenly you have a correspondence between critical metrics and harmonic maps to spheres. And it turns out that harmonic maps, when you look at them on surfaces, they only depend on the, um, uh, they don't depend on a specific metric in the conform class. They depend on the, um, they only depend on like the, the, the conform class itself to define, to see if a map is harmonic or not. And you can see this by the fact that the energy functional, only the, the, the value of the energy functional only depends on, does not depend on the different choice of metric in the conform class, because you'll get a conform factor that will pop off from the, the norm of the, the of the f of the differential, and you'll get a conform factor that pops up from the volume element that I did not write here, and those two conform factors will cancel out in dimension two. 
So ammonic maps are much nicer to work with because you can actually work in terms of confound class instead of specific metrics. And then if you don't focus yourself in a confound class itself, but you also allow variation across all the metrics, so true critical metrics, then the F is actually not only a uh, harmonic map, but also a conformal harmonic map. So it's in fact, you will get a minimal immersion of your surface into spheres. So here you get a nice relationship between critical uh, problems and geometric objects <coughs> that are uh, uh, minimal uh, minimal surfaces in the sphere. Okay. So this is the type of result that are quite nice and that we want to uh, generalize to other problems. So the other problem we had in mind at the, the beginning of our work with uh, Misha Kampukin and Yosif Poltorovich was the Dirac operator. <clears throat> so for the Dirac operator, uh, you need to work a little bit to define it. Thankfully, in dimension two, it's a bit easier than in higher dimension. So I can actually do it in one slide. In higher dimension, I would not be able to do it in one slide, I don't think. So in dimension two, you start by defining a spin structure on your surface. And this is the point where you need uh, that your surface is orientable to obtain the spin structure. Okay. So uh, you define your spin structures on, the, on M. And the way we define a uh, spin structure is that they're holomorphic complex line bundle uh, such that the square root of the bundle of holomorphic one form. So basically, if you don't want to go in crazy, crazy things, basically locally section of S can be written as some function F times something that we call square root of dz, where z is some local holomorphic um, uh, coordinates. And the square root of dz z behave in such a way that if you multiply two, two sections of S together, you get something that will be uh, f times some other function times dz, what dz will be a holomorphic one form okay. locally. So this is how it behaves. You have your spin structure. What you do with your spin structure is you define the spinner, spinner bundle, which is s plus s bar. So s bar is the complex conjugate. So basically, se locally section of s bar will be given by some function times square root of dz bar. Okay, nothing too crazy here. And section of the spinner bundle will be uh, called spin-offs. Okay. okay. Finally, we can define the Dirac operator. Dirac operator will take a spin and will map it to another spin -off. And I'll just write it down uh, locally. So locally, if you write your spin as as uh, f plus times square root of dz and f minus bar times square root of dz bar, <clears throat> then your operator applied to the spin will be some conformal factor, so dz of uh, the metric g, times another spinner, where to get this spinner, what you do is you take the uh, del z derivative or del z bar derivative of the function f plus of f minus, okay? And then you have a twist that will interchange. So f plus, that was the first coordinate in the, on the left, becomes the second coordinate on the, on the right with a minus. And f minus, that was the second coordinate, becomes the first coordinate, so you twist. So basically, the, the Dirac operator is basically you you, you apply the, the cauchy riemann operator, so del z bar or del z, and then you twist it. And this is applied on um, spinners, so, so some section of some bundle over uh, your surface. The idea of the Dirac operator is that, <coughs> is that it's a square root of the, the Laplacian in some way. Okay, so basically, if, if you were on a flat space, so that d, dz is constant, so on R2 with the Z constant, and you apply the Dirac operator twice, you can easily see that you twist two times, so you get back to the, the initial spot and you apply dz and then del z bar. So in the end, if you apply the Dirac operator twice, you get four times dz, dz bar of your function. So basically this is the Laplacian applied to a pair of function. Okay. That's on flat space. On surfaces where you have your, your no metric that's not flat, it's, you don't exactly get that. You'll get that the uh, Dirac operator squared is equal to the Laplacian applied on spinners plus some term that depends on the curvature of your metric, the, the scalar curvature of the metric. But basically, the Dirac operator is a square root of the Laplacian, so you expect that things are nice and you can do nice things with it. In particular, you can look at it, its eigenvalues on a compact surfaces. They are discrete. You can enumerate them. I do it right there, and I'll use 
mu to denote them. Usually they're called lambda or something, but mu is so that it's not the same as the lambda I used previously for the Laplacian. On a surface, so on in dimension, dimension two, uh, you have a symmetry. So the positive eigenvalue are the same as the negative one. So that's why I write minus mu one instead of something else. And also, uh, the kernel of the operator could be non-empty. So don't trust this enumeration of the eigenvalue because I'm only enumerating the eigenvalue that are non-zero because those are the only one that are interesting when you're trying to do optimization. Because if you look at the zero eigenvalue, uh, basically the, the kernel of the operator, of the Dirac operator is uh, conformally invariant, as you can easily see from the from this description, where the only spot where the metric appears is as a conformal uh, factor here. And if you want d of the spinner equals zero, then you can just cancel out this conformal factor, and it doesn't matter which metric you choose in the conformal class to have uh, to look at the kernel of the operator of the Dirac operator. So since they don't vary with the the metric in a conformal class, it does really no point in trying to do any kind of optimization in a conformal class for this, I, those eigenvalues. Okay. So I don't even enumerate them. But they're still interesting to, to study. Like the, the eigenspace of the, the Akopata is really interesting to study. Okay. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, I'll just say, uh, yeah, okay. From the local description, we can uh, see that if you multiply the metric by some conform factor, you have a e to the minus omega that will pop up. So this e to the minus omega comes directly from here. So here you have a dz of g. Here you will get the, the conform factor that pops up. Okay. This is exactly the case I already described in the first part of the talk. So we can just apply the previous calculation to get something like that that conform neutral metric for some direct, uh, normalized direct eigenvalue are equivalent to uh, family of eigenspinners such that the, the, the sum squared is equal to one. Okay. Uh, I should specify that here, the, the norm on the, the spinner is basically the norm that you obtain by looking at the, uh, from your metric, you have a norm on the, um, the, the, the one forms, and then this norm on the one form is induce a norm on the, the spin off. So you can, that's which one we, that's the one we're using here. Yeah. Okay. But we cannot uh, give the same interpretation as in the case of the Laplace uh, problem because we cannot use directly the Psi J as coordinate of some map. Okay. Because the Psi J, as you may remember, the spin offs, they live in the spinor bundle, the section of the spinor bundle. And so their value, if you use them as coordinates, will depend on the choice of trivialization of the bundle you're using. And also you're not sure that if you go around a loop, you will actually close up the map. So you can maybe define something locally that will depend on, depend on the trivialization, but to extend it globally it would be something else. Okay. Instead, you can do some tricks. It's not nothing crazy, but it's nice. It's um, you look first, the spinner live in the bundle S plus S bar. This is not so nice to work with because you have S and then it's complex conjugate. So the first trick is just, you take the complex conjugate of the second coordinate to just look at things that are that are living in S plus S, okay? So both coordinates will live in the same bundle. And then you can define the, the map F, big F, as uh, F1 plus, F1 minus, et cetera. And it will be a map from the surface to uh, C to M, okay? And those F1 plus, F1 minus, they come from the local description of the spinner. When you write the spinner as f plus square root of dz, f, f minus bar square root of dz bar, those are the f plus and f minus bar. And then since you take a um, complex conjugate of the second coordinate, you, you get f plus and f minus, okay? Those are the, the coordinates you have. As I said, this map, you can write it down locally and it de depends uh, on the choice of uh, coordinates you're using on your, um, your manifold, okay? Because the, the choice of coordinate will dictate the choice of trivialization of the, the bundle, the way we wrote it. So you cannot use it globally or use it in any manifold way as it is. What you can do with it is use it as homogeneous coordinate for a map to complex projective space, okay? Since each of the, the things are living in S, okay? When you change the trivialization, 
and S is a complex length bundle, when you change the trivialization, all you do is you will multiply your things by some complex numbers. It will be the same. If you if you change the trivialization in one way, it will be the same for all the coordinates. They will change in the same way. So changing a uh, uh, trivialization will change your F, will just multiply it by some complex number. And then if you look, use it as a homogeneous coordinate, then what trivialization you're using does not change anything because you, you, you're you taking the projection to uh, complex projective space. Okay? And this way, you can also show that uh, Psi will be well-defined globally in, the, in this construction. Okay. So to summarize, you start with section of some bundle, use the section as a um, homogeneous coordinate to a map to a complex projective space. And you can do that because the bundle we're working on, the spinner bundle, is the sum of two line, two complex line bundle, which are pretty much the same up to complex conjugation. Okay. So in this way, you can write everything in terms of CP2 and minus one. Okay, so this is the, the first result we have, is that the map I just described, the big psi, is actually a harmonic map to complex projective space. Okay. And I won't show in details why it is the case because it's mostly calculation, but I'll just quickly say a few words, is that from the eigenvalue equation, the, the big F I described in the previous slide, if you take the Z bar derivative of big F, you will get uh, some factor times I of F, where I of F is this anti-involution where each pair of coordinates, you switch them up, take the complex conjugate, and then multiply one of them, well, the first one by uh, minus. Okay, so. Um, so this is the kind of condition you have from the eigenvalue equation. And in, in a way, what it means is that if you take the del z bar uh, derivative of your f, you'll take the same f you, know, you started with, but rotated compared to the original line you had, you rotate it. That's the i, so it's a sort of rotation. In particular, you live in the, the orthogonal space to the original f, and then you multiply by some constant, well, by, by some function. Okay. And the critical condition, remember, the critical condition was that the sum of the norm of the eigenspinners was equal to one. You can rewrite it as just this, the norm of f times the conform factor is equal to one. So the norm squared of f times the conform factor is equal to one. And then we're starting from those two equations and the factor to mapping to project, uh, complex projective space. And you do some calculation, and you can show that the map will be harmonic. Okay. Now, one question that's uh, quite interesting and difficult is, uh, can we go the other way around? Starting from a harmonic map to some complex projective space, do you get a conformally critical metric G? Well, in general, no. You can't do that. You need to restrict yourself to a smaller class of harmonic map. And you can already see it from uh, the condition I've written there is that the harmonic map you need to consider need to satisfy a really uh, special uh, condition, special equation. This equation that if you take the del z bar derivative of the map in some way, you get something that's uh, in a special direction compared to the original line you had in the in the complex projective space. Basically, is that you have a, a map gives you a line in in a, a complex space, and then when you take the del z bar derivative of this line, you will get another line that will live in a perpendicular to the original one. Basically, that's the, the condition you need to impose on your harmonic map to actually have a hope to use them as a, to find conformally critical metric for the Dirac equation. Okay? So that's one condition you need. The other condition, some condition on the zeros of the branching uh, points of the map. I won't go into details on this one, but basically just know that um, Basically, if you start from a conformal critical metric, you obtain special type of harmonic maps that we call quaternionic harmonic maps. And if you restrict yourself to quaternionic harmonic maps, any quaternionic harmonic maps give you a conformal critical metric. And also, uh, the, 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 the really nice part of this construction is that starting from the quaternionic harmonic map, psi, you recover the critical metric by basically, since you're living in a, in a conformal class, you're only, you can just uh, take any metric in the conformal class and multiply it by uh, some conformal factor that you can just compute from the map to obtain the critical metric. Okay, this is not too complicated. 
but you also recover the spin structure of, on your manifold because uh, re re recall that to define the Dirac operator, you need to have a spinner bundle and to have the spinner bundle in the spin structure. And on a surfaces, you can have different spin structure. Basically, since you're taking a square root, as you can think, you, you're taking a square root. So it means that each time you go around a loop, you can decide if you go back at the same position or if you go back to the minus the position you were before, if you take a loop, right? When, when you take a square root, you can either plus or minus when you patch things up. So basically, if you have a surface of genus gamma, you have uh, two to the two gamma different uh, spin structure on your surface. So it's from the map, you need to have a way to find which spin structure corresponds to the, 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 the critical metric you, you construct from the map also. And you can do that. And the, the way to do that, you actually need the map to be quaternionic harmonic because you recover the spin structure by the kind of condition you have here on the, the map. Okay. I won't go in more detail than that because it gets it gets messy when you, you actually do it. It's a little bit complicated and technical. And I don't want to, to do too much. Okay. But basically, this is the idea. In the case of the Dirac operator, conforming critical metric correspond to special type of harmonic map to complex projective space. Okay. Now I will, I will focus on uh, the first positive Dirac eigenvalue. Okay. So the, one result in this uh, case is uh, Bars inequality, is that on the sphere, the first normalized eigenvalue squared is bigger or equal than four pi for any metric G on the sphere. And you have the equality if and only if the metric is homotetic to the round metric on the sphere. Okay, this is pretty much uh, uh, the equivalent to Arch, uh, Arch's um, inequality for the Laplacian on the sphere, which gives you a, a upper bound for the first uh, Laplacian value. Here you have pretty much the same idea that you have a lower bound given by the, the round metric on the sphere. Okay, pass inequality. Uh, other type of result is uh, some result obtained by um, Bernd Amann in 2006, where he considered the optimization of the first Dirac eigenvalue, in particular, in particular the minimization of the first Dirac eigenvalue. And he obtained quite a few results in his paper. I will only cite, uh, I think, two of them. But it's a really interesting uh, paper. If you're interested in this kind of question, I recommend you go check it out. And um, its first result is the existence, uh, some existence result, because I didn't mention it, but since we're taking infimum on the metrics, it's not clear that you actually have a minimum metric or a maximal metric. You can have degeneracy, you can have really bad thing happening. But most of the time, it turns out, and it's quite interesting, is that most of the time, the kind of degeneracy you, you have is quite controlled when you look at the uh, optimization of uh, eigenvalue problem. You don't have too many crazy things. So for example, in this case, it tells you that if for the first uh, Dirac eigenvalue, you look at some conform class G, G naught of the two, and you pick a metric G prime in this conform class. And if you know that the value of the normalized eigenvalue squared is strictly less than four pi, then the infimum in the conform class is achieved by some smooth metric outside of a number of a finite number of conical singularity. Actually, the number of conical singularity is uh, controlled by the genus of the surface. So basically you have less than uh, gamma minus one uh, conical singularities. Yeah. And this four pi, this is not, uh, it's not random, it doesn't, does, not, does not come from thin air. It's basically the four pi from Bars inequality because this strict inequality guarantees that you don't have a bubbling, a bubbling phenomenon going on, okay? So what happens when you try to minimize something is that you could have a spot on your surface where bubbles start to grow. And at the end, the, in the limit, the bubble pops up and you have a degeneracy and you don't have a true uh, minimum achieved on the, the, in the conform class because suddenly you have a bubble and your original surface without the, the bubble. And to make sure that you cannot have bubble, well, it suffice to show that at least in one metric in the conform class, you have something that's strictly less than the eigenvalue of your bubble. And we know that the eigenvalue of the bubble will be always uh, four pi by Bars inequality. Okay. So basically, uh, Amman's existence result tells you, as long as you don't have any bubbles, you get the existence for the first uh, Dirac eigenvalue and you get some uh, regularity result on the metric. Okay. Another result that Aman got in this uh, paper is that he connected the, the, the mu1 uh, minimal metrics to uh, CMC surfaces, so constant mean curvature surfaces in R3. And the way he does it is that given a mu1 minimal metric, he shows that 
you must have some eigen spinner with constant norm on the on the surface and then you use a tool called the spinorial Verschlass representation representation to obtain from this second spinner uh periodic constant mean curvature surface from the original uh, surface so basically the classical Verschlass representation theorem tells you that on a surface if you have a, like a, a holomorphic function a meromorphic function and a meromorphic uh, one form you can use them those two and integrate them in some nice way to obtain uh a minimal surface in R3. The spinorial representation is basically a generalization of this idea where you use uh, spinal spinels instead of uh, one forms. Uh, okay, and remember, since spinels are kind of the square root of one form, basically in the spinorial re reversal representation, you take like multi you multiply two spinels together to obtain something that will map to R3. It's uh, okay. So in this way, you obtain periodic constant mean character surface in R3. So let's look at those results and in with our uh, own result that we obtain. Okay, first, notice that when we try to minimize mu one, first in general, when try to to do optimization, you have two type of control points. I already discussed it a little bit. You can have a branching, like a crossing of two branches, or a true control point. But then, if you're trying to minimize mu one, you can never have a crossing, right? Because if you're looking at mu one, so the lower branch, well. You, it will always be a local minimum in any type of crossing uh, crystal point you have. It will always be a local uh, maximum. It cannot be a local minimum, right? Because mu one is the lowest branch, so it always needs to be growing and then decreasing. So always be a maximum. So that means that for mu one, you always have a true critical point. And from the the theory I described in the first part of the talk, that means that in the case of in the case of minimization, first uh, Dirac eigenvalue. The, the critical decondition will always give you that you can get one again spinner with constant norm. So that's pretty much another way of deriving uh, uh, Aman's result. So basically, Aman is in his uh, paper he used a completely different way to characterize the minimal metric, completely, completely different way. But at the end of the day, we get exactly the same result, which is good. From our result, this psi will give you a harmonic map to CP1. CP1, you can see it as the Riemann sphere, so basically S2. And finally, a little bit of geometry tells you that uh, if you have a harmonic map to the sphere, those correspond to um, CMC surfaces. So and in this case, the maps big psi that we have are, in fact, the, the ghost map of the CMC surfaces constructed by Aman. So here we recover uh, the correspondence between Aman's point of view and our point of view. Aman is looking at constructing the surface itself, the CMC surface. And our point of view is basically looking at the ghost map of the surface, basically. Okay. And finally, some application to the torus. Okay. So on the torus, it's a genus one surface. You have four different uh, spin structure. One is trivial. It's basically each time you go around a loop, you go back to the same po same point in the the line bundle. The other two, well, the other three are non-trivial, and basically the other three are all kind of equivalent. So in this talk, I will only focus on the trivial spin structure. Okay, you write your torus as uh, just the quotient of the plane by some lattice, and a b will be the coefficient of the second vector of your lattice, and we'll describe the, the torus. And then the spinors uh, on the torus can be seen as c two valued function, and they will satisfy some periodicity condition on the torus. Basically, each time you go around the loop, you want to go back to the same point on the, the spin on the loop. Okay. Nothing too crazy, crazy, and then you identify each conform class by the flat metric G A B in it with uh, volume one, and say, and then the modulized space of conform class with the trivial spin structure. Here, the the, the trivial spin structure, the uh, the modulized space will depend on the, the the spin structure you choose because when you when you look at the, all the different uh, the the symmetries of your surface, you need to take into account the, the spin structure. Is this uh, part of the plane? So each point in this part, so between a will be between minus one half and one half, and uh, a squared plus b squared is bigger or equal to one. So it's this region of the plane, and each point a b give you a conform class g of a b, where g of a b is the flat metric. Okay, this is the setup on the torus, and then we want to look at the optimization, so the minimization problem of the first eigenvalue in all those conform class that are in the modular space. And what we got is this result with uh, uh, Michel Quinn and Walterovich. 
that for the trivial spin structure, for all b that are strictly bigger than 2 pi, and for all a, the infimum in the confound class of GAB of the first year eigenvalue is equal to the normalized eigenvalue of the flat metric. And we can't compute it explicitly. So in, in, in other words, uh, the minimum is always achieved by the flat metric when b is strictly bigger than 2 pi. And we can also show that the flat metric is the unique minimizer in those confound class. So if you look at the pictures, everything that's above 2 pi correspond to uh, the minimum is achieved for the first uh, Dirac value is achieved by the flat metric. Okay. So let's see. Okay, I have. I'll really quickly sketch a proof, but I'll be really quick. What's nice about the flat metric and the torus, you can actually compute explicitly the eigenvalues, and particularly the first normalized eigenvalue. You have something that's 2 pi divided by square root of b. The important fact is the bigger b is, the smaller the eigenvalue. That means that for b big enough, you can apply a man's existence result to obtain some minimal metric. Then on this minimal metric, you apply our result to obtain a harmonic map from the torus to uh, the, the sphere. Then you do a little bit of geometry that I'll skip to go all the way to this point that says that basically the map you can show will, uh, will be a degree zero harmonic map from the torus to the sphere. And you can also estimate its, its energy in terms of its of the eigenvalue uh, you add at the beginning. So basically, you can assume that the energy is small enough. And there's a result that tells you that if you have a degree zero harmonic map from the torus to the sphere with small enough energy, then it must map to a circle in the sphere. Okay. But then you have a map from a harmonic a degree zero harmonic map from the torus to the to a circle. Those you can write down explicitly, and you can show that basically this value is constant, so the del bar uh, norm of uh, psi in the metric, in the flat metric G of AB is constant. And in the way we, we constructed our things is that the, the minimal metric is equal to uh, this value times the metric G of AB. And since this guy, this, this uh, anteolomorphic energy density is constant, then you get that the minimal metric is uh, constant times the flat metric, okay? This is pretty much the, the, the idea of the proof is you start from a harmonic map. You have some result on this anteolomorphic energy of the map to obtain result on the energy of the map and then try to look at what we know about those type of maps to obtain, to know more and more and more until you get, uh, you end up knowing enough about your own original harmonic map to actually deduce what was the original metric, well, the minimal metric, okay? And we still have some open question on torus, and particular, what about b strictly smaller than two pi? So basically, in this uh, uh, moduli space, and for the trivial spin structure, we know what happens everywhere above two pi, and it's not clear what happens on, under two pi. And we, what we expect, and this is a conjecture of us, and Amanda also he said something like that in his paper, is that for the trivial, trivial spin structure on the torus. If you look at the, the infimum, so lambda one is the infimum in this confound class of the normalized eigenvalue, it's either equal to two pi over square root of b, which is the value obtained by the flat metric. So either it is achieved by the flat metric if b is bigger or equal than pi, or you have two times square root of b if b is strictly smaller than pi. So this two times square root of b, if you take the square of that, you recover four times pi, which is the square of the normalized eigenvalue on the sphere. So basically, what this tells you, and that's what we expect, is that you always get the, mm, that the minimum is achieved by the flat metric all the way to the point where you get that the, the actual value of the eigenvalue is equal to the one of the sphere. And once you get that the, eigen, the, the eigenvalue of the flat metric is equal to the one to the sphere, then you can, if you go lower, you get bubbling and you don't have a minimum, but you actually have a, a bubble that blows up of your torus. That's what we expect for the for the trivial spin structure. Okay. And for the non-trivial spin structure, then the situation is less clear. So uh, this result, we have something similar for the non-trivial spin structure. Basically, the only difference is that the bound on the bound on B is uh, slightly different, and the value of the, the actual icon value is different slightly. The big difference also is the moduli space is different because of the symmetry you need to respect on the, the spin structure. To actually look at your moduli space, you have a different moduli space. But 
the, the result itself looked the same, but we can also ask, well, what happened if you're lower than the bound we got in our result? And then it's not clear for the non-trial spin structure because uh, what can happen is that there's some portion of the, the moduli space where we expect uh, the, 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 the minimal metric to correspond to using uh, a man's point of view of corresponding a, a, metric, a minimal metric to a CMC surfaces, we expect that the, the minimal metric will correspond to um, the Lanoe on the Lloyd. So those are like of uh, rotationally uh, invariant uh, um, CMC surfaces in R3, which are like kind of blow up and blow up, blow up, blow up, blow up, like that. I man conjectured this and from our result, we cannot get anything better than what he already conjectured. So we also expect something like that to happen. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Antoine, for your talk. Uh, now we have some time for questions. If anyone has any, either unmute yourself or ask it in chat, please. May I ask a question? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, go on, Asma, please. Uh, yeah, so I wonder if you can say anything about like uh, higher eigenvalue or uh, like the kind of existence or what would be the... Uh, I would like to have some existence result. I expect that we have something really similar to what happens in the Laplace case that we can have, uh, wait, where is it? Mm -hmm. That we can have some existence result up to bubbling, something like that for our eigenvalue, something. I expect something like that to be true. Mm -hmm. It's unknown for the moment. Uh, our result in thermocratization, harmonic map, and everything, this works for our eigenvalue, no problem. But uh, actually, applying basically the first direct eigenvalue is really nice because since you're looking at the minimizer, you actually know that your map will be to CP1, so the sphere. The map you get will be to the sphere, which is really nice and easy to, to deal with. When you look at higher eigenvalue, then you suddenly don't know that it's a true true uh, critical point. So you actually can have multiplicity, and I would expect to have multiplicity. So then the map you'll get, the harmonic map you get from this hmm, theory will be a harmonic map to some CP2M minus one space. And then dealing with those type of map is less simple to obtain uh, results, okay. like explicit results. So so the kind of, I mean, your method uh, doesn't give the existence over existence. You, no. you need to do something else, OK? Yeah, we don't we don't ask the, the question at all about the existence in our uh, method. The usually existence results are kind of technical to obtain and tricky to obtain. I would expect them to hold, but uh, yeah, we don't okay. know yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Asma. Do we have other questions for Alpon? So let's just uh, thank Alpon again. Thank you. And uh, we will reconvene next week.